Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Renaud Gobert. Uh, I'm an engineer at NVIDIA. Uh, I've been uh, contributing to the and working in the com uh, Kubernetes community for the past year with my team, a container team. Um, today, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, GPU as a service. Um, how do you actually deploy a GPU cluster? Um, what are the challenges that you face uh, when you operate a cl GPU cluster, or as a user, uh, the challenges that you face uh, when deploying your GPU applications? Uh, we'll also look a bit into um, how we actually built um, the GPU and device system in uh, Kubernetes. And the um, last part will be about what are the challenges and uh, the different solutions that we want to see in Kubernetes and in general that we want to solve for GPUs. Um, so if we go ahead and look at why GPUs and containers makes a lot of sense, uh, you'll find out that actually containers solve a lot of issues that um, mostly uh, deep learning scientists or HPC applications, or in general, GPU applications uh, have a problem with. Um, so if you're deploying scientists, for example, you, you're going to have a lot of issues. Uh, well, the first thing that you're going to have an issue with is, is actually installing TensorFlow. Um, it's, it's not really easy in container actually solve that, because you actually get really easily into dependency hell. And when you're deploying scientists, you don't want to spend a day at installing and configuring uh, your machine uh, just to get TensorFlow. But it doesn't stop there. Once you've actually uh, set up a GPU application or a deep learning model and then you want to distribute it to your coworkers, well, you actually find out that there's a lot of issues. For example, your GPU model, or your, sorry, your uh, deep learning model is not going to converge or it won't have the same speed uh, because your coworkers don't have the same TensorFlow library. So um, containers actually solve a lot, uh, that, that problem because you're actually just distributing your code with its dependencies. And if you've ever tried to actually install two versions of TensorFlow on the same machine, uh, you'll find out that installing TensorFlow was hell, but installing two versions of TensorFlow is, is even harder. Um, some of the other issues that we're looking at are uh, how do I scale deep learning application? Uh, I've training my model on my machine. Now I want more compute power. I want to scale more GPUs. Um, how do I solve that? How do I deploy a fault tolerant inference service? In general, how do I actually uh, bring uh, the Kubernetes um, uh, the, the, the Kubernetes um, way to GPU services. So to actually solve a lot of these challenges, we've rebuilt our container tools from the ground up to uh, um, will help us uh, support a lot of different use cases. Um, if, you f if you were familiar with NVIDIA Docker before, uh, what we were actually doing is wrapping Docker specifically, and you couldn't really use uh, NVIDIA Docker for like any other runtime. And what, we've, what we did is actually we integrate now at the runtime level. Um, that means that we support a lot more runtimes. Uh, so for example, Docker, CRIO, Singularity, LXC. And if you're actually not familiar with this, uh, the challenges that we're trying to face uh, with GPUs and containers, uh, there's a lot of small things. Uh, the biggest one being that um, the CUDA libraries that a lot of these uh, frameworks or deep learning frameworks depend on, they have this very strict requirement that you, your, your library version must exactly match your kernel, ver uh, your, uh, kernel module version. That means that you can't actually ship a container with the CUDA libraries, or just in general the user libraries that you would like, that, like you would do for any other uh, general application. Uh, we need to actually inject these at uh, the runtime level, um, and or at the run, sorry, uh, step. So um, that's why we basically integrate it at the runtime level. Uh, we have a really, um, in general, the, the the way we are better integrated for OCI runtimes because the way we do it is that we uh, get called at the pre-start level, and that means that. Uh, for a lot of these runtimes, we don't need to ship a specific, uh, uh, a speci sorry, sorry, for a lot of these container 
uh, runtimes, we don't need to, sp to ship a specific runtime. But for Docker, for example, we actually have to just wrap runc and add a single line of code that says, well, add pre-start hook. Um, so that allowed us actually to support a, no uh, a lot of new use cases. And you actually see that uh, on the Docker Hub is that we're uh, slowly uh, actually adding, for example, support for graphics. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting. And now that we actually have these support, we, these tools to actually uh, support more runtimes, we're really looking at Kubernetes. And uh, we've actually been involved in the community for the past year. Uh, at the creation of the, re uh, well, during the part the, where the resource management work group was being created, um, the resource management work group had actually two face to face. We had one recently at NVIDIA uh, in March, and there was actually, a, 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 there's a lot of engagement in that work group, and it, we, we are solving a lot of different challenges. And um, one of the things we actually managed to do is we actually uh, added this new device system, and in a year we graduated from alpha to beta. And if you look a bit at Kubernetes now, you know that upstream GPU is now in beta, but it's still a bit challenging to actually deploy uh, provision a GPU cluster. On the other hand, when you look at what we went through uh, last year or a bit before in 1.6, GPU support actually uh, stopped at one GPU per node. And in 1.7, uh, you, you, you could actually support more than one GPU per node. But you still had this issue that, for example, you had to manually mount your volumes in your pod spec, or you had no GPU monitoring or, uh, or health check. Um, during that year, what we did is we added this new uh, plugin system that allows not only to support GPU, but in a more generic way, more devices. And we're engaging in the community, and especially in the resource management work group, with a lot of different companies to handle things like FPGAs, like uh, Nix, and a lot of different devices. Um, that allowed us, in our case, to use uh, our tools, so the NVIDIA Container Runtime. And in 110, since we graduated to beta, we actually have now health check. Well, we had health check before. We, are, we have some monitoring, and we're looking at solving a lot of different problems like heterogeneous clusters, support for GPU sharing, support for topology, etc. A lot of features that I'll go a bit later into, uh, in my talk. If you look at it from a user perspective, what that means to you is, as I was mentioning in 1.6.1.7, you support one GPU per node. You need to manually mount the, the volumes. So as I was mentioning the different libraries, you actually have to make sure that they are all in the same directory for all the GPUs in your node. If you are actually upgrading the driver, then you have to make sure that you are placing the libraries back in that same directory. Um, at, the, at that time, you had a very fragmented ecosystem, so everyone was doing their own thing. We were doing NVIDIA Docker. Kubernetes was doing its own implementation of NVIDIA Docker. Um, Singularity was doing its own thing, too. And you had this issue where if your GP would, uh, would be in a bad state, it would actually act as a black hole, uh, take the first GPU pod, that, uh, pod that's requesting a GPU. Uh, your pod would get scheduled on that node. Uh, it then would crash immediately. Uh, Kubernetes would try to restart it. After some point, it would pause it, take the next pod, crash it again. So that was a, that, that, that was a pretty brittle support. Um, what we introduced in 1.8 is this uh, device plugin system. Um, what that means is, as a cluster admin, you actually just deploy your daemon set in a cluster. Um, and your cluster then becomes GPU aware. And what that means is your nodes are going to report to your cluster how many GPUs they have. They're going to set up the GPU. So for example, you might want, we, we are going to do some tests on your GPU to make sure that it's healthy. And it'll also play an important role exposing the device and in general exposing um, the NVIDIA driver and fixing up a lot of issues you might have in your container um, so what that means is, as a cluster admin, you have to, if you want your GPU cluster to be, or your cluster to be GPU aware, you only have to run one simple command, kubectl create, and then uh, this URL, which I've abbreviated to, because it didn't fit on the slide. 
And this allows you to just create a basic pod that requests two GPUs. And in the end, as a user, that's all you care about. You just want to create a pod spec that requests a, uh, uh, that has a specific Docker image and just request a number of GPUs. So um, that's where we are right now. Uh, what that means is, however, um, operating GPUs in a cluster has a lot of challenges, either from a, a cluster admin perspective or from a user perspective. The first one you're actually going to run in is, uh, well, you're going to try to do your blue-green update, and you have two GPUs left in your cluster. And what that means for you is you're going to have to deal with resource uh, with the fact that you resource contention, you don't have enough GPUs to actually uh, get your version two on your cluster, and so your, GP, your your version the version two of your pod is actually just going to wait indefinitely. So a few solutions to fix that is you could pre-provision some nodes, or you could try to auto scale. But if you try to auto scale, you're going to hit this second second issue is that if you're using AWS, for example. Um, you, you are limited, you have a limited number of instances, especially on GPUs. So you're going to auto scale and then at some point, uh, you're, going to, you're going to be limited by the number of instances that you can actually uh, spawn. And in that case, you're going to have to open a ticket. Um, so it's usually pretty easy to fix. You just need to be aware that uh, doing a blue-green deployment is something that uh, might fail because you don't have enough resource. Another uh, interesting thing you, that you might want to look into is resiliency for GPU services. Say, for example, um, you have an inference service uh, that's running, and you want to make sure that that inference service is basically, uh, well, it, re it responds automatically on another node if it fails, or you want to make sure that it scales. Um, the issue with uh, auto-scaling is that it takes a lot of time to actually provision a GPU instance. If you're on AWS or GCP, it, it might take between five and 15 minutes. So if you're trying to actually uh, make sure that your service responds pretty quickly, um, five to 15 minutes is not exactly what you want to do. So the good solution that you have here is either you, well, is to pre-provision an instance, unfortunately. Um, one of the other things that you might hit, um, that's something that we, uh, that's a pattern that we've used, for example, in um, one of the demos that we have, is uh, we have a demo where we have an inference service that's trying to um, go through uh, a, a big amount of a flower image and try to identify and classify what, Im uh, what image matches to what flower. Um, we found out that actually loading the data takes uh, 10 to 15 seconds. And we found out that this interesting pattern is that you could actually just uh, split the data from the inference uh, pod and have your data just, uh, well, have your data pod just pre-scheduled on, uh, on other nodes because it doesn't request, it doesn't require you to have a GPU driver. Uh, a, sorry, a GPU. And then you would have your data in your inference container talk, for example, through IPC. Um, so, that would allow you to basically, uh, if you, for example, want to make sure that you have some resiliency, you have a liveness probe on your uh, cont inference container. Um, and once Kubernetes detects that your inference container is down, it will automatically spawn an inference container on another node. And that's how you can actually get to something that's, at least from a user perspective, a lot more seamless than waiting 15 minutes or 15 seconds. Um, the other one is about scaling GPU services. Um, that's one of the requests that we actually get a lot is, or just in general, people tend to get this idea that it's probably better to scale on GPU load. Uh, usually when you try to scale uh, services, it's mostly inference services, and what that means uh, is that your bottleneck is probably not going to be GPU load, and you're better off actually uh, scaling based on QPS. Um, you can actually use intrapod affinity to line on nodes that have your data pod. So uh, you pre-provision some nodes, uh, make sure your data pod runs on these nodes, and use this uh, use the intrapod affinity feature of Kubernetes to make sure your um, 
uh, inference service scales correctly. As usual, you probably, you, you probably want to keep some spare nodes. And so this is also one of the interesting things is that when you're actually building a GPU cluster and you have a lot of, uh, for example, for your data scientists, you're actually going to face a lot of um, issues in terms of how do I actually integrate um, some of the business logic inside that. One of the things you might want, for example, um, is you might want one queue per user and you might want to be able to process the jobs one by one or sequentially for the user. And the issue that you have right now is it's business logic, so you should use an operator. Uh, but if you go down the operator way, you have all these issues where it, it makes some sense to be in, a, in an operator, but it would make more sense to be in a custom scheduler. For example, um, in your operator, say you have, you, you have these three queues and all these pods. And well, you want to schedule the first pod. And so you would basically take that pod, uh, post it to the AP, uh, well, post it to the Kubernetes APIs, and well, subscribe to the events of that pod. So you would look around and make sure that if that pod has been scheduled, then you can remove it from the queue. But if it hasn't scheduled, if it hasn't been scheduled or it failed scheduling, then you have to delete that pod. And at that point, maybe between the moment that you got the event that your pod hasn't been, has failed scheduling and the moment that you actually deleted that pod, it, w it could have gone through the scheduler again and been scheduled. So there's a lot of different, uh, there's actually a lot of business logic uh, that's more advanced than that that you as a cluster admin might want to actually um, get into and there's no actually good solution for that. Um, there are some things that are being discussed in the community. Um, I think it's called the um, scheduler framework that six scheduling is working on. Um, but right now, it seems like a custom scheduler is the best um, way you, you can go through. Um, though, you, still, you, you can still see that it's probably not the best solution. So if we look a bit at more at the developer perspective and That'll give you some insights as to what are the features that we want to actually solve for GPUs and Kubernetes. Um, we're going to look a bit at how it works, and what that means is we'll see a bit at the we'll look a bit at the life cycle of the device plugin. So, as I was mentioning from your from your, from your perspective as a cluster admin, uh, you just deploy a device plugin, and what happens is that uh, since it's a daemon set, it's going to be scheduled on the nodes. The nodes are going to create the containers. Um, you'll probably have a driver install. Uh, if you're on GKE, for example, uh, they have their own uh, driver installer. Um, this works really well on GKE because they're using COS, which is a very locked down OS. We're looking at a more generic solution that would work on other OSs, uh, for example, Ubuntu. Um, once your driver is installed, your device plugin registers to the, you know, with the nodes. Uh, with the node, and Qubit will then call the gRPC API that's in there. So um, your device plugin will notify on Qubit that it has, for example, three GPUs, and if one of the, the GPU crashes, it notifies Qubit, Qubit bubbles that up to the API server, and the schedule won't schedule uh, more than two uh, pods that, well, won't, won't schedule more than two GPUs on that node. Um, if, you, if, the, if you've managed to fix the GPU crash or the device plugin manages to uh, recover some of it, then it bubbles that up to the node, which bubbles that up to the API server and goes to the scheduler. I was also mentioning that uh, we have a container lifecycle too. So when your pod is created from a user's perspective, um, your pod gets assigned its node your node selects the device and then calls this gRPC call that's called pod admission. And for each container, it will issue an initialized container call. When you delete it, we're looking at adding this pod deleted uh, call. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, zero downtime registration. Um, currently, the way you re register your device plugin, well, the way the device plugin registers itself with Qubit is through a 
dual gRPC protocol um, or mechanism. We're looking at making it very simple. Your gRPC server, uh, your device plugin just puts its socket into an agreed upon path with Kubelet. Uh, Kubelet watches that path and then calls the gRPC server. Um, that allows you to actually do zero downtime registration. So if you want to, for example, upgrade your device plugin, uh, it gets scheduled on the node, um, places its new sockets inside uh, that path. Uh, Kubelet will uh, ping that gRPC server. Once it's sure that the gRPC server is up and is ready, it will switch over to the 1.9. And that allows a pretty neat pattern. Um, <coughs> sorry that uh, we're looking into. So for example, m you might want to have in your cluster um, some nodes that have ECC enabled. And what we're looking at is your device plugin watches the annotations on your node. You as a cluster admin add the annotation on your node that says, I want ECC enabled. So nvidia.com slash device plugin, for example, and ECC enabled. Your gRPC, your NVIDIA device plugin looks, uh, well, watches that, gets that event, enables the CC on the GPUs, and re-registers itself against Kubelet. Once again, zero downtime, so that means that uh, you won't get any pods uh, that won't get rejected from your Kubelet. And so all of this is, uh, the, the, the reason I presented all of this is so that uh, you can see now that the, the, the life cycle of the device plugin is pretty much figured out. And right now, we're really focusing on f uh, solving a lot of challenges that you as a user will be able to, um, that uh, you all, as a user will be able to enable you. So the first one we really want to push uh, is GPU monitoring. Currently, you have some monitoring in that you'll be able to see the GPU memory, the GPU utilization, but that's basically it. Um, what we want you as a user to be able to see is a lot more advanced metrics, like uh, the GPU power usage, the NVLink bandwidth, or in general, like the number of SMs that you're using, the temperature, etc. We want to be able to expose a lot of the, these different metrics to you as the end user, because you, uh, you, you'll be able then to ident identify, for example, um, GPU tasks that are trying to that that are just, for example, faulting, or detect power inefficiencies. That's something that might be interesting for you. Or in general, um, you might want to be able to tell your deploying scientists that uh, you've seen some bottlenecks and some throttling on the GPU. Um, other challenges that we're looking at is supporting heterogeneous clusters. So right now, if you have multiple GPUs in your cluster and you, you want to be able to specify some requirements, for example, um, I want to use this amount of memory. I, my task uses at least eight gigs of memory. Um, the only way you really have to do it is you manually label your nodes um, and use taints and tolerations. And you might want to do, for example, NVLink, ECC enabled. And that's something we're uh, looking at in general uh, with a, something that's called the resource class. Um, we also have this. Um, um, this annoying bug that, or just in general implementation shortcoming, that uh, with Docker, you only, your, your only option is to actually uh, set the default runtime to NVIDIA. And that means that all, your, all the Docker images or all the container images that are actually run on your node will use the NVIDIA runtime. Um, that leads to this little unintended consequence that if you have NVIDIA images that don't request GPUs, they'll see all the GPUs. Um, this is something we, we've actually fixed in CRIO because you don't have to set the default runtime to NVIDIA. Um, but we're looking at pushing that uh, in the community. Um, really, what, what, what are the things that are really interesting and we want to solve uh, for the users are GPU sharing and GPU topology. Um, GPU sharing is, a, is an interesting feature that, uh, is an interesting feature that uh, you as a user will be able to, um, well, you'll be able to save some money. Um, mostly, we want you to be able to use our GPUs at its full capacity because it's pretty wasteful for you uh, to actually have a Volta and use an inference service, but it only uses 25% of that Volta. Um, and that's, that's most of the use cases that we see for GPU sharing is mostly around inference. Um, 
the question we're still figuring out is how do we actually expose that to the user? Um, because GPU sharing is something that's mostly uh, going to be about uh, scheduling uh, in terms of how it's implemented in the runtime. It's still something that we need to figure out because we don't have, for example, a specific way to actually limit the amount of memory a specific process or container use. And GPU topology is, well, if you if your if your container actually requests two GPUs, you can't give it any two GPUs on your node. If you have a NUMA system, for example, uh, you might want to be you might want to be able to have these two GPUs communicate uh, through NVLink uh, and not through QPI. Uh, usually, if you actually just um, take any two GPUs, uh, the issue you're facing is that it's probably not even uh, sometimes it's probably not worth to even run the task. Um, we actually have the same problem, is how do we actually expose that to the user? In general, um, these are the challenges ahead in Kubernetes, but even in containers, we still have a lot of challenges. For example, we want to be able to attach and detach GPUs dynamically. We want to be able to support a lot of different architectures. Um, so currently, we, we, we have a support in, con uh, in cost, but there's a lot of other container OS out there that we want to be able to support. Or, virtualization, so for example, Keta containers. Um, as I was mentioning, we're enabling graphics and video encoding, but there's a lot of things that we still need to actually expose uh, with GPUs. So here you go. That was my presentation. Um, <laughs> thank you. I think we still have some time for questions. Um, so. Um, I think there's a mic here. Here we go. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, you mentioned AWS a couple of times there, and I, uh, I recently found out that there's actually two ways to get GPUs in AWS. You can get GPU instances, but you can also attach standalone GPUs to, I guess, any instance uh, type. Uh, are both supported on whatever setup we have today, that setup that you mentioned? Are both ways supported, both a, a proper GPU instance and just taking any AWS instance right. and attaching a GPU to it? So um, the way you're expected actually to, uh, to use GPUs in Kubernetes is um, you provision your node, before you actually uh, register your node against Kubernetes, you provision it with GPUs. If you're dynamically attaching GPUs, uh, we don't really support that. Thank you. I think there's a question here. <laughs> Hi, can you briefly mention what is uh, supported or coming in uh, terms of graphic support? Can I run OpenGL Render and get the frame buffer, things like that? C can you run, sorry, what? Uh, OpenGL Render and get the frame buffer result, is that possible yet or coming or? Um, so I believe we have some images uh, already available on the Docker Hub. Um, I think we support EGL. I believe we support EGL, and we're looking at supporting a lot more. Um, this effort is still ongoing. Um, so depending on what you exactly need, the answer is probably yes, but it all could also be no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very user specific, sorry. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much. Um, and I guess since there are no other questions, um, this is it.